our keynote speaker uh, who is uh, well renowned in Mauritius as such because he's the founding director of the Open University of Mauritius. All right, actually the first uh, local ISO certified public university in Mauritius is a person very much in demand, very much at the call of the minister as such you may say. So any emergency that comes along, he is actually, you know, basically when, 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 when the call comes in, he's actually, he has to respond as such anyway. Uh, he, the Open University of Mauritius actually has been in operation for nearly eight years, all right? And with 8,000 students and still growing. And the last report I read is basically, it's the, not an alternate, maybe the word is wrong and alternate, but it's actually equal to the University of Mauritius in terms of what, in terms of, enrollments that are coming in at the current moment. It's a financially independent university as such. Uh, he's also a fellow of the Higher Education Academy in the United Kingdom, which is a very, very hard, uh, what they call appointment to actually get as such. He's also chairman of the Mauritius Research Innovation Council, which he took over in the last couple of years or so, which he has actually what uh, moved it to a level where research and innovation has become part and parcel of the Mauritian, uh, what he called uh, uh, industry as such anyway. Uh, he has also been the chairman of the board of Mauritius College of Air and Mauritius Museums Council. He has previously worked at the University of Mauritius, the Mauritius Examination Syndicate, all right, and the Human Resource uh, Development Council. Mind you, I'm only giving you a uh, a brief outline of uh, this uh, individual who I have known for a number of years and I'm actually very uh, uh, happy that he has, has, has been able to actually join us in this uh, uh, after his, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, emergency, uh, uh, what, uh, his emergency that he has to attend. Uh, Dr. Sukhan has got other things. Let, let me just touch upon a few things. But he has developed a two-parameter alternative group explicit iterative method. You know, basically he's a math guy, all right, or a, he's basically a, a stats expert as such. Anyway, he has coined the term uh, "be learning," all right, which is blended in order to consider this method of learning as an integrated approach rather than a mixed approach as such. Okay. I think I, I can keep going, but he is a consultant as such for several organizations, UNESCO, ILO, uh, UNDP, and ADA. All right, he has published numerous research papers, supervised several master's and doctoral uh, uh, theses. He's a member of the Senate of the University of Mauritius, the Academic Council of the University of uh, Technology, Mauritius, and he holds an honorary position as Imperial College London in the UK. I think I can keep going. I'd rather stop here. Let me introduce you to my good friend, a colleague, a well-respected member of uh, Mauritius in the higher education uh, uh, sphere, uh, Dr. Kaviraj Sukhan. Dr. Sukhan, over to you. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to share with you our experience. And I'm going to talk about the sudden digital shift to blended learning. Is it possible? Because when the pandemic started, we had um, a number of my colleagues from the conventional university coming to me and say, well, now we have to do digital learning. We have no choice. Um, what can we do? Can we go immediately on blended learning? Are we, how, how to ensure that we are ready, we can do it successfully? Because remember, at the end of the day, what we all are looking for is the success of the learners. So why the digital shift? The digital shift is, of course, because of the pandemic. Everybody's alerted. Everybody wants to move from the conventional method of teaching to go to uh, e-learning, online learning, hybrid learning, technology-based uh, enabled learning. So there's so many reasons you would find. But on top of that, you will find that there are many other situations that would actually force traditional universities, traditional schools to shift to online digital blended learning. Natural calamities, right? 
is, uh, would be one of them. You have uh, many students who do not have access to education. Blended learning, distance learning would allow these students to have access to uh, education. On top of it, you may have riots like we had in South Africa. Uh, now, you would have the universities were closed so due to riots. So if you have universities which are closed due to riots, you will have to ensure that education continues, learning continues, teaching continues. Now, how the pandemic and all those um, issues that have highlighted have been affecting higher education or even secondary schools. Lectures have been canceled. So all the processes have been disrupted. Classes were empty during term time. The buzzing campuses that we are used to are uh, all dead silent. Students studying abroad had to return home. Some were stranded, some were in difficult situation. Affect, this has also affected the health of the students, right? Um, we know some of the cases of suicide as well. There is a climate of fear and risk of transmission, especially now with all the different variants we have been having. Even such as convocation, I must tell you that as the head of the university, I am being each time asked, when will we have the convocation ceremony? Will we ever have the convocation ceremony for those students who have completed? Conferences like this, if I would have been there, I would have been um, not, I wouldn't have missed my keynote address earlier. So conferences uh, on a face-to-face -face mode had to be canceled. Research projects, lab research had to be suspended. Uh, in certain cases, they had to be started all over again. Exchange of staff, movement of staff, training of staff, and all this uh, had to be canceled. And of course, we, there was a loss as well due to reagents, chemicals, materials that couldn't be used. On top of it, um, we need to ensure this is uh, sustainable development um, SDG4 that asks us to ensure that we have inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning. And if you look at the statistics that uh, I could have, you will see that there's still a gap to be filled and those gaps need to be filled and the traditional, the conventional mode of teaching wouldn't allow us to fill those gaps. Now, distance education and blended learning is not a second choice. It is an alternative mode of learning as just as um, Professor Naya just mentioned. So distance learning and blended learning are not second choice and should not be treated as such. Now, is the digital shift always possible? The questions that my colleagues from the conventional universities ask me are the following. Do we defer the semester or make the digital shift? Okay, I said, well, you can make the digital shift. Which online tool should I use then? Do you think the techno technological tools that we have would allow us to negotiate that digital shift? Can we shift all the hundreds and thousands of lectures? Is it really possible to do so? Which one we can and which one we can't shift? Now, what about the practicals? What about the labs? Do we, can we have access to virtual labs? Do they exist? Do our engineering students have access to AR and VR tools online to pursue their practicals? Are the academics ready to teach online? That's the fundamental question. Somebody who has been teaching on a conventional mode, face-to-face, -face, can the person be asked all of a sudden to teach online? Is the teaching in class different from teaching online or blended mode? If yes, how? 
our academics, that is those who are teaching on the traditional mode, are they empowered to make the digital shift? Do we use the same text? Do we use the same lecture notes? Does this work for online classes? Now, on, this, on the part of the students, will the student adapt? Will they accept that sudden change? If they accept, teachers accept, students accept, how do we ensure that we are maintaining the quality of the teaching and learning process? At the end of the day, as I said, the whole point about educating is to ensure that learning takes place. Does learning take, does learning take place? Are there learning theories that support that digital learning? Now, how many online sessions should I have? What should be the duration of the session? This is a very common question I get. Well, in the traditional mode of teaching, I had a three hour lecture. Should, I, should this be equal to three hour online blended mode uh, learning? What if there is a power cut? What if there is no bandwidth? What do I do? Can I use audio only? These are practical questions I have been having uh, before moving to digital shift. How to ensure that there's discipline among those following online classes. We had several cases of misbehavior among students, especially at secondary level, who, who were um, attending online classes, but who didn't show any discipline. What to do with those who are in discipline? Can students record my lecture? I don't want them, some teachers, some educators, some lecturers would come and say, well, I don't want them to record my lecture. What if they misuse it? What if they do something that is not appropriate with the video recordings? What to do with continuous assessments? Students who used to submit hard copies, will they submit online? If yes, how? What about science lab, engineering, arts, music, continuous assessment? We assess only the theoretical part and leave the practical part, or is it possible to actually do the practical part as well? What about the stations? Do we postpone online supervision? If yes, what about those involved in surveys, experiments? Do we conduct exams or not? If we have online exams, will it be fair? Today, Last year, many universities around the world have moved to online exams. And I have till now seen one report that says, well, we are 100% satisfied with the online exams. So how do we ensure that the online exams are fair, fair to everybody? How to prepare the exam paper? Will it be of the same format as we used to be? At it as it used to be, or should it be different in the case of online? If I have online exams, do I have online supervision? What software should I use to ensure that the papers are submitted properly? That would allow the examiners to mark them, that would allow the moderators to have access to them, that will allow the external examiners to have access to them. How to ensure non-academics continue to support the learners? Is the support um, uh, online or over the phone uh, possible? How to ensure that non-academics, because to me, non-academics play a vital role when it comes to blended learning, distance learning, okay. Can we have new intakes or do we postpone it? Uh, Will everybody be back on campus? When, how to ensure social distancing, how to deal with student staff falling ill on campus. So does the quality argument hold to declare ODL as a second choice or is one too many teaching of poor quality? This is a question I'm, I'm asked very often. No, there's no difference provided you do it properly. No difference in curriculum. All programs must meet the same national standard. Both students acquire the same skills and competencies. What happens within the four walls of the classroom? Do we know? Nobody asks the question. What happens within the four walls in the conventional method? In blended learning, 
we have to prepare distance learning materials. We have to prepare e-learning materials. And those e-learning materials are under public scrutiny because they are being shared with everybody. So everybody knows what the teacher is teaching, what the learner is learning. Everybody can assess whether it is comprehensive, has everything that was required to be covered, has it been covered? So how can it be of a quality which is inferior to the conventional when everything is open to the public? We also fight in the same league table as all other universities, right? So many universities, we are subject to same quality audit from the regulators. You will find that many universities are actually offering online courses like Harvard, you have a master in public health being offered online. Major learners with sound knowledge need competent tutors, right? Uh, of course, those competent tutors, I take an example. We run a master's in tax and most of the employees uh, working at the Mauritius Revenue Authority, they follow that course. So imagine any tutor coming to teach them, right, would need to know more than what the students know. So distance education students, most of them are working students. They have knowledge. They, they come to the university with a number of years of experience. And therefore, in distance education, you need competent tutors would be able to meet the requirements of the students. Teaching students who are not present in the same place requires more effort. Many, many people think it's easier, but in fact, it requires more effort because you are not talking to all the students at the same time. They all send you their queries in their own format, in their own language, in their own way. Academics from comprehensive universities often teach at open universities on part-time basis. This is the case, at least at our university. We provide e-library, uh, that e-library uh, gives you up-to-date e-books, e-journals, compared to traditional libraries, uh, where the new editions take the time that it takes to, to be on the shelf. So, Learner success, how, do we, how can we achieve that learner success? We provide the online support hubs, right? We use learner an analytics. What is learner analytics? When you are doing teaching online, when you are teaching through blended mode, you don't have to wait end of the semester to tell the student that you have failed. Using learning analytics, you can monitor the performance of the student throughout the semester. You can, as soon as you identify the weakness, you can provide support. And that support can be digital because you have identified the weakness. You can provide materials to consolidate learning to ensure that the student is moving uh, forward after having taken, uh, taken care of the weaknesses. There is that culture of care. That's why I say that we have to ensure that uh, we provide, uh, there must be a number of non-academics to provide that support to the learners. Online support is available through our learning management uh, platform 24 by seven, right? Uh, and we are providing support and keeping that human touch. That's why we are, we are for blended learning. Blended means there is that uh, contact with the tutor, there is contact with the student. Of course, there are certain challenges. Digital learning doesn't come like that. It comes with the challenges. The dropout rate can be high if you have not prepared the tutors well, if the students have not uh, been prepared well. Right, And if the teachers have not been well prepared, there will be no interaction. If the teaching is not personalized, this can, this can also raise certain issues. Materials, if they, are well, if they are not well designed, can also alienate the students. 
when designing distance learning materials, you need a team of people, competent tutors who know their subject matter, those who can develop the material, right? You have uh, the designers who are very important, instructional designers um, form vital element of that team. Academics from tra traditional universities who are not always good at ODL actually would not uh, help students to learn. So employability of graduates sometimes, and I still find it employers say, well, uh, they would prefer students from traditional rather, rather than from distance education. So what is being done? If you have a proper distance education model, if you have a proper blended learning model, what you will have is independent learners rather than uh, isolated. So the whole aim of the digital shift would be to ensure that we have independent learners rather than uh, isolated learners. We can increase the interaction through video, online interaction, use of augmented reality, virtual reality, virtual labs, and artificial intelligence. Now, what I have done is that based on the queries, based on the support that my colleagues were asking me, I developed what I call a practical blended teaching and, uh, and learning model that has just appeared uh, last month in the Ubiquitous Journal. So this is the model that I developed, that I shared with my colleagues in order to ensure that they are able to make the digital shift correctly. Now, first of all, you will see in the model, the learner. The learner has to, we have to ensure that the learner has a good mastery of language and we can provide that language support prior to the start of the semester. We have to ensure that the learner has been fully trained to, to learn through blended learning mode. How to learn through blended learning mode? Because they usually come from conventional secondary school, so they need to be, to uh, they need to be trained to learn through blended learning mode. Time management skills, uh, you must ensure that your learners have time management skills, learning skills, because dropout is because many students do not manage their time. When they go to conventional universities, they have lectures to attend, they have friends, there is peer pressure. Here, they're alone. When they're alone, there is isolation. And this is what we should avoid. They must be independent, but not isolated. Uh, induction sessions have worked pretty well at our university, and we have always maintained that induction session. So there are certain things that the university must have, the curriculum, right? That has to be well designed and instructional designers are vital at that stage self. Development of learning materials. Materials have to be developed together with audios, videos, animations, right? Real case studies that would make the material interesting. You cannot move to digital learning or blended learning if you don't have a good e-library. An e-library is vital. A proper learning management system is uh, very important to ensure that learning takes place. Content offering tools to allow people to produce proper materials. Assessment and evaluation, there are many ways of doing it. But unfortunately, if you take the traditional exam paper and try to have it uh, through the online exam, uh, it not, it's not going to work. In blended learning, the role of non-academic would be is equally important uh, than academic support. So administrative student support is as important as academic support. On top of it, students need support at the workplace, at the family level, uh, to allow them to have time. I very often during the induction, when talking to the 
uh, new students joining the university, I, I keep on telling them, please ensure that the family is aware that you need time to learn. To, to learn, you need time to dedicate to your studies. Ensure that they're aware of that and that you have every day some time uh, allocated to your uh, learning. So this is this model, as you can see, takes care of a, a number of issues that we have raised earlier and it provides the framework to ensure that we have an effective blended learning mode to have in order to have a successful learner. So that would be uh, all from me. If you have any question, I would be glad to, 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 to answer them. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Once again, uh, can you accept my apologies for uh, this delay in the presentation? Thank you very much.